I thought it would be great to begin this year by just acknowledging that today, January 1, 2012, is the fifth anniversary of the planting of the Gathering Nashville. Yeah, five years. That bad, huh? I've had a good time myself. We have, we have been in this theater here, Carmike 20, in the Cool Springs area for five years. Five years ago today, we launched this idea, this dream. Abraham Lincoln said this, My dream is of a place and time when America will once again be seen as the last best hope of the world. My dream is and has been that there will be a time and place when the American church will once again be seen as America's last best hope. I believe in the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that together we can make a difference, that we can live on mission, that we can be a movement, not just a stagnant, right? Listen to how powerful this idea that we are engaged in is. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about me? Some think you're John the baptizer. Some say that you're Elijah. Others say that you are Jeremiah or at least one of the other major prophets. He pressed them. How about you? What do you say? Peter, don't you love Peter? I mean, Peter always had something to say. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, all synonyms of the same idea. Jesus said back, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonas. You didn't get that answer out of a book or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. A church, here it is, so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. That's out of the message paraphrase. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. How about Hebrews 10? Let us think of ways to motivate and stimulate and encourage one another through acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect gathering together. The word church literally means a gathering. It's a Greek word that had no religious overtones or connotations to it. It's just a gathering. Jesus took that word and said <coughs> that I am going to create my gathering, my church of individual believers. And together, we're going to change the world. 40% of the people on the planet today say they follow Jesus Christ. 40% of 7 billion people. Over 90% of some of the African nations right now are Christian, 90%. South Korea is over 50% Christian, more than America. They're predicting that in the next 20 years, if things continue the way they are, China will be more Christian than America. Some estimates say between 80 and 100,000 people come to faith in China every day. I talked to a pastor, a local Franklin pastor, just the other day, just last week, who just returned from China. I said, what's it like? He said, well, there's the state church and there's the underground church. And I said, well, tell me about the underground church. The underground church ain't underground no more. He said, you got to stand in line about three or four hours to get into the church. And sometimes you don't even get in. He said the Chinese government has seen the power of what a Christian does in society. They stopped even trying to keep records. They just say, go to church, be a Christian. We like the way you Christians work. Isn't that interesting? This is real life, real world, right here, right now. The church of Jesus Christ will prevail. I can't think of anything better 
and to give our lives to and to serve Jesus Christ together on mission, on point, as a movement. On the first day of the week, that's today. So we know the first day of the week we come together to worship, to serve, to give, to support, to be the church, to motivate and stimulate one another, to be this expansive church with energy that changes the world. I don't know about you, but I am here at the gathering to change the world. How about you? to make a difference in the world, to make the world the kind of place God had in mind. I will confess that I have been guilty, as guilty as anyone else, of my criticism of the church. But at the end of the day, the church is Jesus' agenda to save the world. Shouldn't we expect some, an idea so powerful to be easily manipulated by those who want power? Shouldn't we expect it to be opposed? Think of this. In America right now, 40, they tell us 42 million Christians will not go to church today in this country. 42 million. Christians will not go to church. Some of them are just flat out lazy. Can I hear an amen? But the truth is most of them have been wounded and hurt and manipulated. They would love to be in a loving environment like this one, but they have never found it. And that is a crying shame. Can I hear an amen? How many times have I heard a college student who've lost her faith tell me about some war story about being raised in a boring church? Literally thousands of churches today in America will be empty or at least practically empty. More people than we would like to admit today will be asked to leave their churches and not come back because they've gone through divorce or addiction or some moral failure. You tell me what's gone wrong when millions of people on, in, in this country can sit today in thousands, hundreds of thousands of churches and billion, billions of dollars worth of buildings and nothing change. Something's wrong, right? The answer would be Yes. I mean, I can't see, but I know there's somebody here, right? (laughs) What's gone wrong? Is the church still God's idea? Yes. It's his agenda. It's his mission. It's his saving place in the world. What's gone wrong? Let me suggest a couple of things that I notice as a pastor. For 40 years, I have been a pastor. This coming, or this October, I will be actively a pastor 40 years. We've lost, first of all, we've lost our urgency, right? There's an old story about three demons who were collaborating on how they could best do their job. And one of them said, I tell you what we need to do. We need to oppose Christianity by telling people there is no heaven. That way the incentive, you know, they won't have any incentive to be good. The other demon said, no, 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 just don't tell them. Let's tell them there's no hell. That way they won't have anything to fear. The other demon says, no. He says, those are good. He said, but I got a great idea. Let's just tell them there's no hurry. Right? I mean, think about it. Our lives go on year after year after year after year. And somehow we just get used to the complacency. But as a pastor of a church, There is an urgency about what we do, right? Do you understand this? Lives are on the line. Souls hang in the balance. Some of us could be an eternity before we meet back here again. Do you understand this? Each one of us is a member of the body. God is reconciling people. Listen, life is too short and the stakes are too high to waste one more day 
playing church or peddling religion. It's about Jesus, the gospel, redemption, and hope or nothing. Right? We're a Jesus church if you haven't figured that out. We worship Jesus. We love Jesus. We believe that Jesus was 100% God, 100% man, and our redeemer. So many churches have not only lost their urgency, they've lost their message. For literally millions of people who attend churches in America today, it would just be a mass counseling session. It's just good advice. It's therapy. We no longer believe that Jesus can save, heal, love, resurrect, reconcile, and restore our lives. Do we? Do we believe this stuff? Do we believe that Jesus loves the world? Do we believe that real life does not revolve around sex, status, salary, or success, but real life, true life lived to love Jesus is about service and serving God's agenda, to love people back to life? Mark 8, 35, the New Century Version says this. Those who want to save their lives will give. Those who want to save their lives will give up true life. But those who give up their lives for me and for the good news will have true life. Real life is loving Jesus and loving what Jesus loves and loving people Jesus loves. And that, my friend, is messy. Can I hear an amen? People are messy. We've lost our mission to go into all the world and make disciples of all the people groups. So we come to church, we go, we come, we go, we come, we go. We put our Bibles in the back windows of our cars and we never read them again. We never study or pray. We never gather with other people. We never extend ourselves. We never serve people. We never do anything. We just come. Even if we come, we feel like we've done God a favor. What is the mission of the gathering? To help. It's on the front of your program. On the front of that program, by the way, you get every week is all the information you need. It's the name of the church, where we meet, when we meet, the website, and what we're all about. Connecting messy people to God and each other. If you want to know what God is up to in the 2012, I can tell you I'm so glad you've come. God wants a family. God is in the relationship business. He wants people to know that he loves them. And he wants the freedom to love them well. But they have to respond to the gospel. They have to say yes to Jesus Christ. And you know, there are two ways you get into a family, an earthly family, right? Everybody know that? Two. One, you are born into it. I'm a foster child. Don't feel sorry for me. Paul and I are so into this foster parenting, we have three foster children of our own. The second way you get into a family is how? Adoption, exactly. One or the other. In the spiritual realm, when you come into God's family, you are both born again and adopted. That's a double whammy. That's two times privileged. God is into reconciling. He wants people to hear the gospel. He wants them to repent. At the program, at the, uh, at the, uh, you know, at the CD table, you, get a, you can get a free CD of, of all the talks that we give here. And, and the only thing we ask is when you're through with them, pass them on. We've had a lot of requests this week for the talk I gave at Christmas Eve. Was anybody here at Christmas Eve? Oh, my Lord. Was that awesome? Yes. It was just one of, it's one of those nights God shows up, right? I don't know how it was for you, but it was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. And I decided, you know, as a pastor, you know, my, I got a tough job. I mean, you're a hard group. I got to come in here and entertain you for about 30 minutes, right? 
You say, well, we're not into entertainment. Shut up. Yes, you are. You want to be entertained. You don't want to be bored to tears, and you shouldn't be. So on Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve is hard to me. It's just one of those, like, say something we haven't heard. Jesus born in Bethlehem, and into the angels, and it was a stable, and it was swaddling clothes, and let's go have some punch. And it hit me when I was preparing that one of the most permanent memories of my disappointment with church is that I never really heard that I can understand somebody tell me how to be a Christian. I should be and all that. I mean, just simply, I think they assume that if I stay around Christians long enough and hear enough sermons, I'll figure it out. And so I sat down and I said, you know what, what, what would it be just an easy pathway the four R's. And people have said, boy, do you have that? We want that. We have that this morning at the CD table. You can take that. Just pass it around. First thing you've got to do is you've got to realize. Realize where you are and separate it from God. Receive Jesus. Repent and then respond. The four R's. That's our simple mission. Is to get people to Jesus and then bring those people in to connect them to God, and then connect them to each other. The assumption is, somehow, that when you know Jesus, let's say say you become a Christian. Again, this is how I was raised. I'm not saying this is anything about your church. When you come down front in my church and and, and get saved, right? Does Does anybody know what that word means? Get right with God, become a Christian, become a follower of Jesus, a thousand ways to say it, I suppose. The assumption is you're fixed. All right? You're fixed. And if you aren't fixed then, by the time you get baptized, okay, then you are fixed. Here's the interesting thing about the American church is that we will love you as long as you're a pagan. You know, I mean, if you've killed three people and, and, you know, and robbed banks in four states, we'll pray for your salvation. But if you miss Sunday school and church three weeks in a row, we'll pray that God will kill you and take you to hell. Right? We're the only organization on the planet who shoots its own wounded. So we figure that when a person asks Jesus into his heart and he's and he's baptized, and he joins the church, then he's fixed. Can I just say this to you? You can love Jesus, you can serve Jesus, you can know Jesus, and you still are messy. And you still are going to sin and fall and fail. You're going to still have to get back up. As a brother, you're going to do things as so stupid you can't believe you did them. Have you ever said anything and you said, I did not say that? That is so stupid. It did not come out of my mouth. And it did come out of your mouth? And you did da- great damage by what you just said? Just because I'm a follower of Jesus doesn't mean at all I understand how to build and grow loving, redemptive relationships, does it? So what are we, what's our mission? Our mission is to help you connect to God through Jesus Christ, the hope of the world, by, by meeting him and knowing him and experiencing him as Lord God and Savior and coming King, and learn how to serve his agenda. And together, we become a movement. So what's gone wrong with the American church? In my humble estimation, we have lost our urgency, we fail to realize that, that, you know, for me, every seven days, hearts and souls are on the line. People laugh at me because they ask me, what, do you, what did you do last night to celebrate the new year? So I went to bed. Now, I'm an, I, 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 I don't stay up late anyway, but here's my feeling, right or wrong, whether I accomplish it or not, 
I owe it to you today to be at the top of my game as much as a heart surgeon does on Monday morning doing a bypass. Would you agree with that? I don't need to be out partying, having fun, and, riding, riding, and dragging here and say, oh boy, I just have to have fun. I need to be rested. I need to be prepared. I need to be on point. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. It ain't about me. It is about you and God and Jesus and what he wants to do for you, in you, and through you right now. That's why I don't get up and tell you when Paul is giving me a hard time. I just bear that burden all by myself. We've lost it. <laughs> You're welcome. We've lost our urgency, we've lost our message, we've lost our mission, and we've lost our movement. We're a movement. Which, the one of the things about a movement is that it, this is a test, by the way, it moves, right? There you go, right? It's moving. But today we have defined the church in terms of brick and mortar rather than mission and message, Right? If someone were to say to you, where do you go to church? You say, well, I go to the gathering. It's going to be all the way down the line before you tell them that, well, we meet in a theater. Sorry. I'm not. I'm thankful. We, live, we have a space to meet in. You know why? Because when we get through here at about 1230, we're on the move, Right? We're moving. We're moving out into the neighborhoods. We're moving out into the businesses. We're moving into the music business and the literary field and the educational field and the health field. We're constantly, all of our people constantly moving, right? And when we're moving, we're like carrying this message. We're a movement. Of my 40 years of ministry, 16 of them have been spent in temporary facilities. I never signed up for that. I want to be the pastor of First Self-Righteous Baptist Church with a big steeple and a big pulpit. Come on. Big old white one. A big old thing. I got several thick leather Bibles. And I've got them just where I can just snap them. But that wasn't God's will for me. God says, you got to go hang out with a bunch of messy renegades who don't like church buildings, who don't like organization, who don't like denominations, because all of those things, as good as they are, have been used to misuse and abuse my people. So, what are we? You know, what do we want to be? Again, let me say it one more time. Life is too short and the stakes are too high to waste one more day Playing church or peddling religion. It's all about Jesus or enough or nothing. When I wrote this particular talk, under this heading, What Are We? There's 21 things. I'll save you and give you just the top three. The gathering is a safe place. It's a safe place. I'm not telling you we won't embarrass you and we won't make people angry who you bring with you, but we won't do it on purpose. If we do it on message and on point, then that's just the way it is. But this is a safe place. This is a safe place where it's okay to not be okay. You notice today when we started, I didn't say how you're doing so you could say still in one piece. I thought I'd give you one day to not lie. I just thought, well, it wouldn't be good to start the first day of the year just telling the lie. Sometimes when you say, still in one piece, you're lying, and I know it, and we know it, and that's okay. But you'll get there. We'll get you there. We'll be with you. This is a safe place where it's okay to be not okay. It's a safe place to question. It's a safe place to wonder. It's a safe place to grow. It's a safe place just to sit and watch. It's a safe place to heal. It's a safe place to be. Don't you think a church ought to at least be that? We're also an army of one another's. And all believers with one heart and one mind, no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And much grace, great power, much grace. 
I mean, what can we do by ourselves? Not a lot. Not a lot. I mean, you, you leave us by ourselves, to ourselves, to think and talk to ourselves. Most of us will shrink back in the corner and just hope and pray to survive. But put us together. Put us together. I mean, we become a powerful force. We're an army of one another. I'm here to serve you. You serve me. We serve each other. In the name of Christ, right? The people who come and set this up and then take it down and teach our children to set up the class. People ask me, you're in a theater. How do you have children's classes? You create them. You buy stuff and you put it in a trailer and you store it off site and then someone has to get up in the snow and the cold and drive that big sucker over here. Some other crazy people take it out and some other crazy people put it up and the other people, you know, teach and put it back. Oh, that's, wow, that's a lot of trouble. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of trouble. But you tell me, the pro you tell me the value of a young boy or a young girl never knowing a day that they weren't right with God, loved by God, known by God, planned by God, and had a destiny given to them by God. Tell me the value of that. How much money do you save in premarital or divorce counseling if a man and a, and a woman grow up in a loving church where they learn what it's like to be a man and what it's like to be a woman and what's God's will for them to live in a family together? Tell me that. How much money is saved when I don't have to go to three or four alcohol dry out treatment centers? Because I've never had to drive my pain and shame inward. When I walked through my brother's addiction, I learned. Before then, I was like, you know, people, people, I would use the word like drunk, and I apologize to even use it now as an illustration. I would never say that again. I learned what it's like to feel as though God were far removed, remote, and uncaring. Do you think anyone who is addicted to alcohol wants to be? I've heard people, yeah, he just wants, he doesn't care. No, he, yeah, he does, he does. He cares, trust me. This is hell, folks. Hey, man, come on, somebody, can somebody help me out here? This stuff is hell. So you tell me, when the men and women who set this place up and teach our classes and do all the things that make the gathering work, and they get up here and they pull these stupid cords and they set up these instruments and they do all they did Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve you all get to come and just, and it's awesome. And then other people get to put it up and take it down and set it up and do all this and go get this and go get that. Why do they do it? Because if they do enough of it, they'll go to heaven. No, they do it because somehow, somewhere, they understand what's at stake. Christmas Eve, souls were in the balance, right? Do you understand that? Today, souls are in the balance. Not only you sitting here, but people in hospitals, hotels, and homes listening right now. The church of Jesus Christ serves you best when it points you to Jesus, loves you best when it accepts you as you are, but refuses to leave you as we found you. We serve together, love together, give together, build together, grow together. So not only are we an army of one another, we're also together and motivated. Now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family citizens of his country and you belong in God's household with every other Christian every Christian belongs in a good loving dynamic growing church every Christian now I know Christians who have chosen to live for God outside of a local church 
And I will have to say that I am really sympathetic to that. But let me say this to you. It is not God's will that you walk alone and live alone. It is not God's will that you look at his church merely as an institution, an organization, or a building, or a set of offices, a set of people who will do really weird things. The church is people, right? I've served the church 40 years, and I am, I, I, I'm thrilled then when I was 18 years old, Paul and I decided that we are going to invest our lives in planting and growing and leading spiritual communities organized around Jesus. Have we had some hard times? Yes, because you people are weird. Have I said this before? But you know what? When we have needed the church, when I mean needed the church, the church has without exception always been there for us. I think the gathering has an amazing future. I hope you believe in that. I hope you believe that God sovereignly has brought us together, put us here at this moment, to be together, to serve, to grow, to help connect people to God and each other for the purpose of changing the world. And so let me leave you with our three, what I call our three U's. Our urgency. Jesus began his public ministry with these words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim <coughs> the year of the Lord's favor. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the only message of hope the world will ever get. Do you understand this? The problem with the people you're related to is not that they need more therapy. They need Jesus. And a life-changing, born-again, earth-shattering, soul-changing moment. They need Jesus. Well, that, you know, that's what people say. That, you know what? Because it's the freaking truth. It was the truth before you got here. It'll be the truth after you're gone. Our urgency is to love people back to life by introducing them to a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. To say what you need is, not a, is, is, a, is a friendship with God. You need a relationship with Jesus. Right? We're not, we're not just, well, God loves you and Jesus loves you. Let's get personal, right? Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. You need to be saved. There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. There is a heaven to gain, a hell to shun. Everything is on the line. You need to know Jesus. And we need to have an urgency about that. We need never live in despair over anyone we know. There is no one beyond the love and grace of God in Christ. Yes, Not even your mother-in-law, not your brother, not your neighbor, not the meanest person you've ever known. There is no other institution. There is no other organization. There's no other collective group. There's no other movement charged with this task. God had one son. He did not make him president. He didn't make him an educator. He didn't make him a musician. He didn't make him an author. He made him a savior. We needed a savior, and God gave us one. That is our urgency. Our uniqueness, to me, is we want to be a church where messy people, a safe place where messy people can meet a merciful God and get their life changed. How's that? You can say it any way you want to. 
I dug back through some talks I've given in the past, some things I've written, and I found this paragraph. We ache to be wave makers in a crazy, dangerous, uncivilized, risk-taking movement whose mission is the fueling and funding of a global revolution aimed at the radical reclamation of the human heart driven by a relentless, passionate pursuit of the divine scandal, namely that every life matters to God. Here's another paragraph I found. We want people to understand that our quest is to create an atmosphere in which the radical love of Jesus can call, capture, and radically alter otherwise independent, self-reliant, self-willed people and change them into passionately devoted followers of Jesus. Christ and genuine, generous servants whose life goal is to glorify God by loving one another, serving one another, and together serving as a roadblock to hell. We want to make it hard to go to hell from here. You say, well, yeah, but, you know, Pastor Dave, I, I've been reading books, and people say there is no hell. Trust me, there is. There is a hell. I'm not for it. Some of you say, do you believe in hell? No. This is why I preach Jesus. If someone were to owe you a million dollars, would you want it paid? It's okay to say yes. Would you want them to pay you? Would you want the judicial system to back you up? Would you want that payment of that debt to simply be called justice? When they paid you your million dollars, even if you had to take them to court, you wouldn't say, man, I just appreciate it. You've been so gracious. No, they haven't. They've given you what is. You owe a debt to God you can never pay. You are, and I am, in a moral deficit that can never be made up. And the only payment for that debt is the death of God on the cross and the resurrection out of the grave. That debt applied to your life is called grace. Keeping you alive until you can get the grace is called mercy. Right? In Christ, there's mercy and grace. Yea, God. Outside of Christ, there is nothing, listen to me, but justice. And none of us want that. You do not want. People say, I just want what's coming to me. No, you and here's the last one. Not only our urgency and our uniqueness, our unity. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope. You are called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in you all. That proves that the Bible is written in the South. Our unity. Listen, if you're not into Jesus and you're not interested in being into Jesus and you're not open to being into Jesus, you probably should move on. Out to change the world. My brothers and sisters, as we sell, as we launch into this new year and we believe can we believe God together for great things? Can we? To save people, to bring people, to supply all that we need, to give us a vision of the future. People say, well, what? You know, will the gathering have a building? Yes. Yes, we'll have a building, but not next week. We'll have a lot of things. I was talking to Rudy Kalis the other day. I met Rudy somewhere, and I said, Rudy, and Rudy was my neighbor over in Bellevue, when I lived over there, or, 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 or a neighbor of sorts, and I said, Rudy, I haven't seen you in a long time. He said, yeah. He said, you're the, you're the, you're the guy that's going to change the world, online church. I said, well, I'm not quite there yet. But you know what? We serve a big God. Right now, this service is being webcast all over the world. Anyone who wants to come to gatheringnational.com and watch and listen and hear can. We have five podcasts every week. People can get it anywhere they want it. They can watch the video of this. I don't know why they'd want to, but they could. 
They can listen to the audio anytime they want to on thegatheringnashville.com. We rent this whole building every seven days and turn it in to a grace place. How does that happen? Because together, we can change the world. Giving together, serving together, loving together, moving together, we can change the world. I honestly believe, I'll say amen, that Nashville needs a church like the gathering. I hope you believe that. We're not just another place where people can come and pacify or satisfy their guilt. We are, we are a dangerous place where lives are changed, where eternities are altered, where love is given, and where we serve because we love Jesus and we love what Jesus loves. Amen? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will bless your church that she will be a mighty church, an energetic church, an expanding church. I pray for every person in this room that this year you would move in their hearts to serve, to give, to support, to be an evangelist for the agenda of the gathering Nashville. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Go get them.